tourism is an important part of the tourism industry around the world. From hiking, to mountain climbing, to staying in an eco-lodge in the jungle, many destinations rely on their rural tourism provision to bring in much needed revenue for the local economy. But what does rural tourism actually mean? What is it all about? In this video today, I'm going to reveal all. And if you are new here, my name is Dr. Hayley Stainton, and I'm here to teach you more about the travel and tourism industry and how we can all be better tourists. So let's start off by talking about what is rural tourism? Rural tourism is tourism which takes place in non-urbanized areas. Rural tourism is closely aligned with the concept of sustainable tourism, given that it is inherently linked to green spaces and commonly environmentally friendly forms of tourism, such as hiking or camping. But rural tourism isn't just one form of tourism, it's actually an umbrella term. This means that the rural tourism industry actually includes a number of different types of tourism, such as golfing tourism, glamping or woofing, to name just a few. Rural tourism is distinguished from urban tourism in that it typically requires the use of natural resources. The OECD states that rural tourism should be located in rural areas, functionally rural, built upon the rural world's special features, small-scale enterprises, open space, contact with nature and the natural world, heritage, traditional societies and traditional practices. It should be rural in scale, both in terms of building and settlements and therefore small scale. It should be traditional in character, growing slowly and organically and connecting with local families. It should be sustainable in the sense that its development should help sustain the special rural character of an area and in the sense that its development should be sustainable in its use of resources. And rural tourism comes in many different kinds, representing the complex pattern of the rural environment, economy and history. So you want to be a rural tourist. What things can you do? What activities are there? There are lots of different rural tourism activities that people can take part in and many reasons that a person might be motivated to be a rural tourist. Motivational reasons include the desire to relax, wanting to take part in sport, wanting to experience culture, seeking adventure, looking for a, a retreat, seeking novelty, for health reasons, and for education and to learn. We can do this in so many different ways. Some traditional rural tourism pursuits include walking, fishing, hunting, camping, cycling. And there are also a number of modern pursuits that are packaged and sold as part of a rural tourism holiday. These include mountain biking, quad biking, water sports, wellness, rural retreats, and team building activities. Alongside this, there are also many special interest holidays that take place in rural areas. There are things such as heritage tours and activities, wildlife spotting, or visiting, or petting, skiing, painting, sightseeing, canal cruising, photography, climbing, caving, horse riding, pony trekking, and winter sports. And lastly, rural tourism can be the perfect ground for educational opportunities, such as geography field trips or team building. So let's talk now about the different types of rural tourism areas, because there are lots of different areas. Now, the titles that I will go through are based on what they're called in the UK, but it's pretty similar around the world. The first type of rural tourism area is the national park. In the UK, there are 15 national parks, which are protected areas because of their beautiful countryside, wildlife and cultural heritage. A national park is a protected area. It's a location which has a clear boundary. It has people and laws that make sure that nature and wildlife are protected and that people can continue to benefit from nature without destroying it. People live and work in national parks and the farms, villages and towns are protected along with the landscape and the wildlife. There are also areas of outstanding natural beauty known as AOMBs. An AOMB is exactly as it says. It's a precious landscape whose distinctive character and natural beauty are so outstanding that it is in the nation's interest to safeguard them. There are 
38 AOMBs in England and Wales. Created by the legislation of the National Parks and Access to the Countryside Act of 1949, AOMBs represent 18% of the finest countryside in England and Wales. There are also eight AOMBs in Northern Ireland. Each AOMB has been designated for special attention by reason of their high qualities. These include their flora, fauna, historical and cultural associations, as well as scenic views. AOMB landscapes range from rugged coastline to water meadows to gentle downland and upland moors. And there are many sites of special scientific interest. Sites of special scientific interest are the country's very best wildlife and geological sites. SSSIs include some of the most spectacular and beautiful habitats. Wetlands teeming with wading birds, winding chalk rivers, flower-rich meadows, windswept shingle beaches and remote upland peat bogs. There are more than 4,100 sites of special scientific interest in England, covering around 8% of the country's land area. More than 70% of these sites, by area, are internationally important for their wildlife and designated as Special Areas of Conservation (SACs), Special Protected Areas (SPAs) or Ramsar Sites. So let's learn a little bit more about these SACs, SPAs and Ramsar Sites. These are Special Areas of Conservation which have been given special protection under the European Union's Habitat Directive. They provide increased protection to a variety of wild animals, plants and habitats and are a vital part of global efforts to conserve the world's biodiversity. Special protection areas are areas which have been identified as being of international importance for the breeding, feeding, wintering or the migration of rare and vulnerable species of birds found within European Union countries. Ramsar sites are wetlands of international importance designated under the Ramsar Convention. And wetlands are defined as areas of marsh, fen, peatland or water, whether natural or artificial, permanent or temporary, with water that is static or flowing, fresh, brackish or salt, including areas of marine water, the depth of which at low tide does not exceed 6 metres. And then there are national and local nature reserves. Local nature reserves are for both people and wildlife. They offer people special opportunities to study or learn about nature or simply to enjoy it. There are now more than 1,400 local nature reserves in England. They range from windswept coastal headlands, ancient woodlands and flower-rich meadows to former inner city railways, abandoned landfill sites and industrial areas now recolonized by wildlife. In total, they cover about 35,000 hectares this is an impressive natural resource which makes an important contribution to England's biodiversity. There are also a number of heritage coasts and European geoparks. Heritage coasts represent stretches of the most beautiful undeveloped coastline which are managed to conserve their natural beauty and, where appropriate, to improve accessibility for visitors. 33% of scenic English coastline, which equates to 1,057 kilometres, is conserved as a heritage coast. The first heritage coast to be defined was the famous white chalk cliffs of Beachy Head in Sussex, and the latest is the Durham coast. Now much of our coastline, such as the sheer cliffs of Flamborough Head and Bempton, with their huge seabird colonies, is protected as part of our coastal heritage. European geoparks are areas in Europe with an outstanding geological heritage. There are two in England, the North Pennines area of outstanding natural beauty and the English Riviera in Devon. So now that we know a little bit more about the different types of rural areas, why are they so important? Well, tourism makes up just one very important part of the rural economy. Rural tourism provides valuable commercial and employment opportunities for communities that are confronted with the growing challenge of offering viable livelihoods for their local populations. Without these opportunities, People may be forced to relocate to populous areas, often resulting in separated families and economic leakage in the local community. Now let me give you an example of this. In Northern Thailand, many tourists choose to go on hiking tours, staying in homestays and spending their money in rural communities. This is fantastic because it provides local people with work opportunities that they would not otherwise have been exposed to. Many women, sadly, leave their home villages in Thailand to work in the sex tourism industry, where they can earn a far higher wage to support their families. But, with the growth of rural tourism, many women have been able to avoid moving to the red light districts of Bangkok and Pattaya, 
and instead have been able to make an income in the rural areas in which they live. In addition to this, rural tourism can help to disperse tourism in highly populated countries. This effectively directs tourists away from some of the more well-known, busy areas and provides work opportunities and economic activity in alternative areas. It also helps to combat the challenge of limited carrying capacities in some destinations and the negative environmental impacts of tourism. As I explain in many of my videos, careful tourism management and sustainable management is really important. So what are the roles and responsibilities of the different organisations that are, that are responsible for making sure this is the case? Rural areas need to be managed in order to preserve the natural beauty without limiting activities of economic benefit. There are many organisations in which have an interest in rural areas and how they are managed and used. These include Natural England, Visit Britain, the National Trust, the Forestry Commission, the National Park Authorities, the National Association for Areas of Outstanding Natural Beauty, English Heritage, the Countryside Alliance, the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, and the Ramblers Association. These organisations are all involved in managing the rural tourism provision within the United Kingdom and there are very similar organisations in other countries around the world. Their main responsibilities are to do things such as promoting rural pursuits, giving tourists information, offering advice, providing revenue channels, ensuring there is legal enforcement where it's needed, protecting the environment and protecting the wildlife and educating people. There are many different ways that we can embrace rural tourism and really enjoy the rural, natural environment and it's a great form of tourism. What's your favourite rural tourism activity? Let me know in the comments and if you have liked this video, make sure to give me a big thumbs up.